Osmo Crafts was started 42 years ago by Joanne Bryce. So we have about 180 people a week mm -hmm. through here between students and staff and members. Terracigelata on the outside, of, or maybe not. That does have terracigelata. Yeah, this one does. Yeah. yeah, it's a white clay with terracigelata. So it, without that, like the smoke and the deep blacks that it picks up, it just won't get it. You know. You get a nice breeze for doing that too. Up here. I like the way the pieces come out, and I like the process. But the best thing is the, the aroma I carry around afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> Smells like burnt moist hair. Because, <laughs> in fact. <laughs> Everybody asks me, what is that smell? I say, and I just kind of like walk away. <laughs> but I'm pretty much like it. Definitely like that side. Mm -hmm. It's cool. This is good. That's your signature here? Looks like he's pulled out a lot on the side of it. See it? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's smaller, finer. Smaller, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, it's just a squirrel cage hung up and down, and so I created a little vacuum box. And um, it works pretty good. Um, this is uh, our recycling center, so we've got a little mixer and a, and a pug mill, and um, we recycle a lot of clay. Uh, so our students, uh, you know, they, they buy their clay, and in the cost of the clay is included the firing fee uh, and all the glazes and all materials, and um, they can reprocess it themselves, or they can give it to us, and we reprocess it and sell it back to them at a lower price. Large. One's an updraft and one's a downdraft, um, which just this is essentially, you know, that has to do with where the chimney is. The chimney's on the top of this one and the chimney's on the back of that one. Uh, and uh, they're both great kilns. Everything we do here pretty much is cone 10. We do a little bit of cone 5, 6, maybe once a month in electric firing in that range. But everything else is, is cone 10. And um, this is, you know, the greenware section and, and glazeware is down here. And then our student work. Um, all just get stacked up along in here. They're not original kill, you know, we just mm -hmm. keep fixing them and rebuilding them and doing what you got to do to keep them going. Um, because they're fired, um, we do at least two firings a week, but sometimes four, mm -hmm. you know. So, uh, you know, they're, they're always, one's cooling and one's firing. This one's cooling, you know. It'll be fired again on Monday, so. Most of our students, um, you know, have a locker, and uh, that's, you know, always a good thing to have some locker space. 
Um, Serve as a damp box too? Huh? Serves as a, as a damp box also? Well, no, actually, we this is our wet room. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's not a true wet room, but we keep things covered in plastic. And, um, you know, it, it works pretty well mm -hmm. as long as we stay after it. And that's a big part of what staff does here is stand after pots, keep them covered, keep them moist, not let them get too dry. You know? <laughs> Come on in, we'll show you. Hi, how are you? You just missed me trimming. I'm oh. all done. When you started, anyway. Joanne, did you have a vision that it would be this big? You know, it was purely accidental. I, this was originally part of my house. This was my own private little studio, and that was a garage. And in 1970, my mother, who lived, my parents lived next door, uh, she fell and broke her back. And in those days, um, we couldn't get any kind of a caregiver out here. There was no bus. Uh, everybody was out here. There was a set of soldering circuit boards. <laughs> and um, the hospital said, well, she could come home if she had you know, someone to care for her. And uh, my stepdad was still working. And I was teaching high school. I just took a year off. And then people started saying, oh, we understand you're teaching me at night. I did sort of both for about a year, went back to teaching, and then finally said, you know, I think I got a business, and I've been doing it ever since. So it was sort of gradual, but here we are. After all those years. This is our glazing group. Come on in. because, you know, they want to try pottery, but they stay because of the people. This is um, what we call Studio B. Um, and so we're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And when you're a student, you can come here whenever you want at no additional cost, period. That's uh, no if, ands, or buts about it. And uh, there will be somebody here to instruct you when you show up. Um, that's just the way it is. So if I come here and I see a new student in here struggling, whatever I'm doing, I set it down and I work with that person. Um, so this is sort of, uh, it's our hand building space. Um, and then we've got some overflow wheels. So if somebody shows up and they want to practice and the main studio is full, they come back here. And there are people who just prefer to work back here and come back here and work all the time. Oh, these, you'll see these hanging all over our studio. Uh, we put these in three years ago. They're air filters. It has dramatically improved the air quality in here. This next space down here is Paul Rubio. Mm -hmm. um, looks like Paul. Yeah, looks like Paul. So uh, this is where Paul is uh, doing his stuff. Um, and this is my space here. Um, and so actually in the summertime, my Goodwheel is outside. I, I try to do real large work, like the stuff I was in the kiln during the summer when I had, can work outside. Um, and so I've been doing a series of free workshops uh, for the studio. And actually, they're the fourth uh, Sunday of every month that any of you could come. But I did one on pitchers and one on wine goblets. And so I've got some pitchers and wine goblets, which aren't things I, I usually make. Um, but our students, you know, we have students who want to learn them, and um, all of our teachers are really good, but like if you've been doing ceramics for a while, you have your thing that you do, right? And so we want to make sure that our students can kind of get a, a big arc of things, and so it's been really good for me as a potter to say, well, i got to go back to making some wine goblets, i got to remember how to do that so I can teach a workshop on <laughs> it. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? And that's been really good for me. And same thing with pictures. It's like, okay, what are some basic picture forms? And because I, I pretty much do decorative work, um, like as my own work, but it's been good for me. And actually, it's been kind of rekindling a passion for uh, the functional wear, which is what got me into pottery. That's the best thing about teaching, isn't it? That it forces you to kind of have exposure to all different things. I really love to teach. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a, it's a total joy. Um, and if you come down here, this is uh, Thomas Arakawa. Um, he didn't have much work. Thomas is at a gallery in Palo Alto. He's a Japanese potter, and his stuff is, uh, you know, very... Well, you'll see, this, some of his stuff is up here. Um, and we have some of his stuff upstairs. We'll show you. We have a little gallery upstairs. Um, so do you... Pay for space by the square foot, or how does if someone wanted a private studio, how, how would that work? Um, it's as they become available, mm -hmm. and um, right now there are no private spaces available. Um, and uh, there is uh, there is a price for that. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, it ends up being more of a barter. Okay. Um, you know, we need people with ability and skill and experience to do things, and so we end up working on you know you give us some hours and we provide you with some space, kind of. Uh, uh, deal. Nice. Yeah. And this is the dry material room. Um, I guess you can come on back in here. I have a collection of pottery. It's, um, it, some of it goes back 40, 50 years. Some of it's relatively new. It was bigger before the Loma Prieta earthquake, but <laughs> and at the time, I can remember thinking, oh, I'll never get over losing that piece, but now I can't remember which they were. So. <laughs> Some of the pieces that I am so glad I still have, because the potters are no longer with us, is a couple of pieces of, from Sandra Johnson. Does anybody remember Sandra? A brilliant, brilliant potter that died way too young. But this is curious because that is a screw-off top on a piece of paper, which is fairly unusual. Sandra was brilliant at this. It's she took the secret with her when she left. The lamps are Raku, and um, they're, they're easily 40 years old, because mm -hmm. I made these a thousand years ago. <laughs> this is another Sandra Johnson piece. Paddled salt fire. We actually had a salt fire kiln, high fire salt kiln here for a while. Um, and you know, when I moved here, I moved here in 1965, my neighbors that way were a goat farm and horse ranches and apricot orchards. And as the neighborhood changed, certain things weren't very doable anymore. Mm -hmm. High fire salt kiln was rather polluting. Did people complain? No, no. I just felt it was time. Mm -hmm. We also at that period of time had something called the pine beetle blight. Remember, it was mid-70s, all the pine trees were dying. The only pine tree on my property that survived was the one next to the salt kiln. I don't think the beetles liked the salt. <laughs> Sulfuric acid. Yeah, it was a little right. toxic. For <laughs> anyway, so the square piece there is uh, from Bizan. I spent a week in Bizan at a potter's village at uh, Yu Fujihara. That was in 1981. And uh, again, had more of those pieces before the earthquake, but that one survived. I couldn't afford his work, but I bought stuff from the premises. <laughs> this flat piece there is actually was made in this studio by Bill Brown, again, who's no longer with us. And um, it's actually a slab piece that's then put on a mold which is attached to the real head of the Fortis throne, which is a really cool technique. The things in the cabinet and on the wall there are pieces of my mother's. My mother was a China painter, she was trained in Switzerland at a school, a finishing school for young ladies that she said taught the young ladies the most important things, which was to paint china, handle staff, and marry well. <laughs> <laughs> but she was a, an excellent artist. Again, mess of her work. Um, the piece on the top you can take a closer look at, that's a piece of, it's probably dusty in there, David. It, it's a piece with Roman gold on it as is the lamp behind you there. Wow. That's uh, Roman gold and also um, yeah. enamels. But she did buy her, she did go through those. How much time would go through these things? Um, many, many, many hours yeah. and about 25 years, because you fire every time you put on a layer of paint. 
that lamp with the enamels and the gold, you can't get this gold anymore. It's called Roman gold. And it's the only thing you get now is liquid bright gold, which is nowhere near as attractive. But the lamp is a piece of uh, pre-war Japanese Satsuma pottery that my one of her brothers bought back. She had a brother who was a talented musician, and he, the only job he ever held in his life held in his life was he played the tea dance piano on the President Wilson as it went around the world for many, many years. Anyway, that's, uh, that's her picture and that's her work. The platters on the wall are by Jerry Hurst and Lucy Omo. Um, they both have been students here, Jerry a teacher here. Um, Jerry throws most of the stuff and Lucy does about 80% of the decorating. At this raku, actually. The centerpiece is a cinnamon clay raku with a clear glaze. It comes out with that sort of cantaloupe color. And those are just slips raku with clear glaze. As my mother got older, she lived to be 90. As she got older, she couldn't do the fine painting anymore, so she decided to become primitive. <laughs> and my stepfather was a photographer, he was a professional photographer, and they traveled the world hundreds and hundreds of trips and he would bring back pictures and then she would paint so these two little girls at the time these were her uh, great grandchildren and they were uh, two and about one at the time and the plate was done as I say by in collaboration for, with her and another friend of hers who was a very good portrait artist that's China paint fired so many she was times able to do China painting until she was she did China painting probably till the year before she got very ill. But as I say, she became a primitive when she could no longer keep her hands steady. The thing about that piece, if you look at it closely, it is cracked right down the middle because yeah. the little girls were here visiting me when they were like five and four. And I was doing some, it was on a table. It was actually over here by this lamp. And uh, I was doing something and I heard this crash. And then these two little charming little girls came running in and said to me <laughs> with tears, we woke ourselves, we woke <laughs> ourselves. So they woke ourselves, but we glued it back together. I had the privilege of meeting Maria Martinez, who was the Indian potter from San Ildefonso that really revived the Mexican, I mean the, uh, excuse me, the Southwest pottery tradition. The Indians in New Mexico suffered from the depression long before the rest of the country. And uh, there were a couple of wool buyers from the east that saw the work of these ladies and started bringing it to New York and selling it in the galleries and it really created a whole new industry. And uh, the, uh, the blackware is from San Ildefonso and uh, the red is from Santa Ana. Uh, I met Maria through her son, uh, her son's wife actually, who I was in graduate school with at Stanford. She was a business major. And um, he is now in Salo Defonso, runs the gallery there. And it's an amazing place to go. Some of these pieces, the little white, these are all from Akuma, which if you, ever get outside of Albuquerque is a fascinating place to go. This is from um, hmm, Jimenez, the Jimenez Pueblo. Um, there's some Navajo pottery back there that has a shine to it because their clay has a lot of mica in it. And they low fire it in a, an earth, uh, earth covered kiln and then put um, pitch from the pine trees on the outside. 